excited to have with us Dr. Emer Kaner as our pastor for the day here in chapel. Uh, he was born and raised in the home of an Islamic leader in Columbus, Ohio, came to Christ as a teenager at a Baptist revival meeting service, and the rest of his life is different because of that night. Uh, very well educated at Chris Wool College at Southeastern Seminary and the University of Texas where he did his PhD. And as I recall, Dr. Kaner, I, your dissertation was on one of my favorite people of church history, Dr. Balthazar Hoopbeyer. Truth is forever. And a tremendous Anabaptist theologian I hope that you encounter along the path of your studies and understanding uh, of church history. Dr. Kaner has done a wonderful job at Truett McConnell. They're, get, they're just having their golden years right now under his leadership, uh, doing such a great work there. He also writes extensively, a scholar in the area of apologetics uh, and history, has written several award-winning books uh, that have received wide attention on Islamic evangelism and related issues in particular. Just a great kingdom service and he knows his way around the sermon as well, as you're going to hear. We're delighted to have him with us on this day. We also have a time now for the reading of the Word of God, and Thomas, why don't you come on up? Uh, would you join me in standing, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word? I believe we're in the book of Deuteronomy today. Is that correct? What passage? We are Deuteronomy 4, 9 through 14. Good stuff. <laughs> Gee. Hear the Word of the Lord. Only be on your guard and diligently watch yourselves so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen and so that they do not slip from your mind as long as you live. Teach them to your children and your grandchildren. The day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, assemble the people before me and I will let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and may instruct their children. You came near and stood at the base of the mountain, a mountain blazing with fire in the heavens and enveloped in totally black cloud. Then the Lord spoke to you from the fire. You kept hearing the sound of the words, but didn't see a form. There was only a voice. He declared his covenant to you. He commanded you to follow the Ten Commandments, which he wrote on two stone tablets. At that time, the Lord commanded me to teach you statutes and ordinances for you to follow in the land you are about to cross into and possess. And uh, Dr. Kelly, before I go any further, I would just be amiss not to say thank you for incredible decades of service, your imprint upon my life is evident as well, along with uh, Dr. Paige Patterson and others. So thank you, my brother, for investing so much into the kingdom. He's right. My dissertation was on Balthasar Hubmeyer. Uh, he is the hero uh, of the faith for me, not just because of his strengths, but because of his weaknesses in his life as well. That uh, Remember, there's no such thing as a stained glass saint. Uh, we always prop up church heroes, but we forget how human and sometimes how weak they are. Uh, and so Hubmeyer, I wrote my dissertation on and became such a hero to me that when my wife was pregnant with our third child, uh, I told her, if it's a boy, his name's Hubmeyer. Balthasar Hubmeyer will be his name. We're not arguing about this. We're not discussing this. This Turk is stubborn in his way. His name's Balthasar. So she started to pray for a girl. And um, now, 11 years later, Anabaptist Elizabeth is our uh, daughter. I was going to have something in my house named Balthazar. So I have a 120 pound German shepherd named Balthazar Hubmeyer, and he is not a pacifist. And so uh, I just, I love, I love being in the mountains of North Georgia. I really can't believe God has allowed me to be where my wife and I are. You have to understand, we never pictured being there. You know, I'm Turkish, my mother's Swedish, my wife is Czech. And we're in the mountains of North Georgia. We came from Southwestern Seminary where I had served under my mentor. And uh, when we were there, my children were five, three, and one. And so we wanted their first language to be their mother's native tongue of Czech, which is a very difficult language to learn, but we were teaching them Czech. And then we moved to the mountains of North Georgia. And so their first language is redneck and their second language is English. And we got a little bit of sprinkled in Czech in the middle of all of it. 
but we love it. We love what the Lord is doing uh, there. It's amazing to see how God's working in so many places within our six seminaries and within our colleges and so forth. And I want to speak to you on regard to part of that topic. If you will turn in your scripture to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I want us to read verses 13 through 18. This is part of the benediction of the Apostle Paul. The letter has been picked up. Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus are picking up a letter in Ephesus to drop off to the Corinthian church. And the Apostle Paul needs to write what is a stern warning while in the same way a strong encouragement to a troubled church. And I want you to notice how he speaks to a troubled church in verse 13 through verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Watch. Stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that is, first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, but what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. The picture of the Corinthian church is much like the picture of the church today. Imagine if you took a microcosm of 1 Corinthians to see how troubled this church was. For the first two chapters, all Paul does is admonish them that they are becoming a selfish church. The second two chapters, they are becoming a worldly church. Now what happens to a church that is both selfish and worldly is the rest of 1 Corinthians. Sexual immorality, chapter 5. They're divorcing each other, or suing each other, chapter 6. Divorcing each other, chapter 7. Their minds have become desensitized, chapters 8 and 9. They, some have fallen into idolatry, chapter 10. They're taking the Lord's Supper in vain, chapter 11. They're taking spiritual gifts given to them by one holy God and they are paganizing them to make them look like the world, chapters 12 through 14. Yet in all of that is the irony that the greatest chapter of any epistle of the resurrection is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the great encouragement is found in chapter 16. And a church that's so dark, so troubled, so difficult, so tumultuous, comes a word of encouragement from the apostle much like what we have today. You see, you can hear all the statistics. I'm not quite sure why we hold to statisticians as being accurate. They're sort of like election pollsters. They have numbers that look right until the day after. But statisticians can give you all sorts of problematic issues of church, can't they? So for example, Pew Research, perhaps one of the most pessimistic ones, in 2015, put out a survey of where world religions are going over the next 35 years. Over the next 35 years, Christianity of all forms and fashions will go from 2.18 billion to 2.92 billion. That should be encouraging to us. We will be growing by over 700 million if those statistics are true. However, Islam, which at that point was at 1.6 billion, will be growing to 2.76 billion. And so the next question from the statistician is, why is Islam about to outpace Christianity as the largest religion in the world by the time 35 years pass or the Lord comes back before them? Why would that happen? Well, the two answers that statisticians give is, number one, the birth rate for Muslims simply outpaced that of Christians. And that is certainly true. But then the alarmist tells you, as the Pew Research will say, that over those next 35 years that we have, until about 2050, Western Christians will walk away from Jesus in massive exponential numbers. In fact, the numbers from Pew say that 106,110,000 Christians that were sitting beside us in Sunday schools and in churches and VBSs will no longer be beside us. They will no longer be teaching their children the ways of the Lord, they will no longer be faithful and dedicated to the local church. That should be alarming to all of us, except it's not the only survey out there. And in fact, the survey that I have seen that is far more accurate 
should be both a warning and encouragement to us. It just was put out this year. Harvard University blended with Indiana University of Bloomington to ask the same question of how faithful are Christians, in particular in the West, and of that, in particular in North America. The survey is far more optimistic than not. In a survey written by the Federalist by Glenn Stanton, here are the conclusions of Harvard's survey. Quote, Mainline churches are tanking as if they have supersized millstones around their necks. But many of these folks, hear me, many of these folks are not leaving Christianity. They are simply going elsewhere. Defined, by the way, as those, they're leaving churches that deny the reality of sin, that support abortion, that ordain clergy and same-sex relationships. For every one church member that an evangelical church loses, five mainline church members come to evangelical churches a little bit more optimistic. The survey goes on to say the percentage of Americans who attend church more than once a week, who pray daily, who accept the Bible as wholly reliable and deeply instructive to their lives has remained absolutely steel bar constant for the last 50 years or more right up to today. In fact, since 1989, 39% of those who belong to religion held strong beliefs. Today, 47% hold strong beliefs. But then you have to answer the question. You hear all the people say during the college years, that's when I get them, between the ages of 18, they'll say up to the age of 29, they're not coming back. They're becoming nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They're dropping out of everything. But is that really true? Here's the end result of the survey. Leading sociologists of religion find that these nuns, N-O-N-E-S, return to church when they get married when they have children, when they start to live a real adult life. However, the increasing delay among young adults in entering marriage and family is likely lengthening the gap. So I'd submit to you that we're still considering the methodology of the 1950s for statistics and not considering the cultural situation that my generation beginning and now this generation, they're not getting married until they're 25, 30, 35 years old. They're not having children until they're 35 or 40. And what has caused every generation, every generation in America since its founding to come back to church is when you hold that bundle of joy in your hands and you realize you're not alone, you can't do it alone, and you need the help of someone who is much powerful than you, and they come into church and they sit in our pews and they know they need Jesus. It's not as pessimistic as it sounds. And it wasn't for the Apostle Paul with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was in trouble. It was struggling. It had been planted about a decade previous. It was hurting. The Apostle Paul doesn't rely on cultural innuendos to give him encouragement for the future. And instead he gives us what I think is a barometer for today. Because you and I know that while mainline churches are hurting and dying, and I think you're going to see the end of some of the movements that had begun during the Second Great Awakening, we in Southern Baptist life are not immune to it either. In my home state of Georgia, out of 3,600 Southern Baptist churches, 1,700 baptized zero. We are in difficulty. But I think the scenario that Paul plays out is not one of pessimism. It's one of reality. What would the apostle tell us today that we need to do and we need to accept in order that we could see a renewal. A renewal that will lead to refreshment and a refreshment that leads to revival. I would submit to three things. Look at verse 13 for the first one, the first half of verse 13. The Apostle Paul to a troubled church says the first two phrases out of four imperative phrases, watch, imperative phrase number one, stand fast in the faith, imperative number two. First thing our apostle would tell us this morning is simply this. Stay awake and stand firm. If you're writing down notes, the key term for today's church is simply this, vigilance. Vigilance is the prediction that God still is in control, that God still holds the church, that God will not fail, that the church will not fail, that is controlled by the Lord, and that the future still is bright, even if the present is troubled. 
The vigilance that we have is both defensive and offensive. What is the first thing a church should do when it is hurting and troubled is not to go fight. The first thing that he says here, the first imperative literally is stay awake. It's defensive. You'll see it in other writings. You'll see it in Matthew where he'll say this, while we slept, the enemy came. The first issue for a troubled church, whether it is our own personal lives, our own denomination, is simply vigilance that is defensive. So many times we want to fight, but before we fight, we've got to make sure Ephesians 6 is true in our lives. We have to ensure the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, that we are fully guarded. Because if any one of those is missing in our lives, the devil knows you. And he doesn't only know you at your weakness, he knows you at your strength. And he can make your strength a weakness that then becomes an opening for him to hit you with his arrow. Watch is the surrendered statement of dependency that is called upon every Christian, in particular of those who are hurting, because we assume so many times that the world comes into our churches and they hurt and corrupt our churches. But have we ever thought about this? If we do not watch, if we do not stay awake, many times it'll be our churches that go out into the world and corrupt the world. That's what happened to the Corinthian church. They had slumbered so deeply, they denied the resurrection. They were destroying their own community. They were called to be a lighthouse too. That has happened within church history. If I were to ask you what one publication has more diminished the gospel than any other publication within the last 200 years, I'd submit to you that it was published in 1859. It was The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. In one fail swoop, all of the sudden, no longer did people see themselves created in the image of God with the centrality of the glory of God, but instead everyone was defined as an accident with no purpose and no God, and God was not merely shuffled from the centerpiece, God was moved away from human history, and we simply became a genetic accident. But nobody ever asked this question. Dr. Darwin, before he became a naturalist, what did you want to be? Ah, that's right, he wanted to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happened? Dr. Darwin sat in the same pews that you and I sit in today, but the difference was his pulpit was compromised. He heard his preacher deny, compromise Scripture. And where did he begin compromising Scripture but in Genesis 1-1? Why in the world Genesis 1-1? Because there is no John 3-16 if God did not create. You see, the ugly truth of history is not that Darwin gave birth to evolution. The truth of church history is the church gave birth to Darwin that gave birth to evolution. The, the, the idea that Paul has given us here is, wake up, it's not over. Wake up. We still have victory and vigilance in this call that it wasn't merely a defensive mechanism, it was an offensive mechanism. It was a picture of doctrine and passion because the second imperative is not merely to watch, but to stand firm, stand fast in the faith. That is a call to 1 Corinthians 15, to the Corinthian church that had such immorality because they first denied doctrine, they became immoral in their behavior. And he looks to the Corinthian church and he warns them, Your doctrine must be pure, but then listen to me, your passion must be pure as well. We live in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not Stoicism 101, this is a relationship with our Lord. And as such, hear me very carefully, if your passion for Jesus doesn't balance your principles for Jesus, you will not last in this relationship called Christianity. It's not possible. It's not possible because if we're in a relationship, it requires passion. If you don't believe me, gentlemen, you who are married in here, go home this evening, look your uh, wife in the eyes romantically and say this, honey, I love you because I have to. Here's what's not going to happen tonight. Passion. Because we're not in a philosophy. We're in a relationship. I met my wife on a mission trip to the Czech Republic. 
We dated for a week and got married. That's a story for another day. We dated the most romantic way every woman dreams of through the internet. When I flew back over to teach at Southeastern, she was over in Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic back then. And I knew I wanted to marry her. But I needed to fly over to ask her formally. And I wasn't going to spend $1,000 on a ticket for a woman to tell me no. I got that for free on this side of the ocean. I wasn't going to spend money for a woman to tell me no on that side of the ocean. So my wife and I were on, you want to talk about old school? We were on AOL Instant Messenger. That's how long ago this was. All right? You paid by the minute. That's a sin. And being the arcane Neanderthal that I am, I asked my wife, Hannah, would you ever think of marrying me? She said, well, that's between my Lord and me. Click, she's off the internet. She said, I'm going to go pray about it and look at his word, and it's out. No perpetual internet, right? She turned it off. I'm in my office at Southeastern Seminary. My palms are sweaty. I don't know what's going to happen. I waited for what seemed like an eternity. My wife came back, and she said this. The Lord spoke. I said, great, what did he say? She said, 1 Samuel chapter 1. You can imagine how quickly I flew over to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and my wife's name is Hannah, I, ironically, the person in the story is named Hannah, and the passage said this, God gives you the petition of your heart. And we knew we were to be married, and I was so grateful God didn't give her Matthew 16, 23, get thee behind me, Satan, <laughs> <laughs> because you're an offense to me. Southern Baptist, we've lost a million members. What are we to do? Watch, guard yourself. Stand fast in the faith. Don't give up on the doctrines, the fundamentals of the gospel, because it will be our only hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the last two imperatives. is not merely vigilance, but he then says, I love the old King James, quit you like a man. Literally, be brave, be strong. Two imperatives. Be brave, be strong. Now you have to ask for just a simple question. Paul, who are you talking to? You're talking to Corinthian believers? Are you kidding me? These people are having sexual immorality, not even named among the Gentiles. Paul, why not give up? Paul, they're suing each other. They can't even get along. They're divorcing each other. The family's absolutely broken. Some of them are worshiping false gods, and you talk to them like there's hope. Be brave, be strong. How dare you do that? Why not give up? You don't give up. Because as long as the resurrection is true, there is hope for any church. There is hope for any church. It's the reason why I sign off on all of my uh, emails, truth is immortal. Because the picture of the resurrection is, listen, truth can diminish Truth can get down and decrease, but truth can never die because truth is in the person of Jesus Christ. And when we declare he is risen, that is a declaration that any church that holds to the resurrection, God's not done with them yet. It's not merely vigilance, it's victory. It's not victory that's experiential, it's victory that's already given to us. Experiential victory that you and I have in our lives daily give us hope for the day. The resurrection gives you hope for eternity and every day. The greatest revival you can see in Scripture happens between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Look at the difference. They delivered a letter from Ephesus to Corinth, and everything changes. The first two chapters of 1 Corinthians, they're, they're selfish. Then they turn into servants of the Most High God. The, the, the first in the second two chapters, when they have a worldly mind, all of a sudden they become the great theologians of their city. All those broken families, now they take a stand for what is right and decent and pure. What we need today are men of God who will come to the pulpit of God with a steeled backbone bathed in prayer with a prophetic voice far more than a popular voice. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way 
when he was warning his own denomination that would decline so rapidly over the next few years. Indifferent to truth and righteousness, God does not choose milksops destitute of backbone to wear his glory upon their faces. We have plenty of men made of sugar nowadays that melt into the stream of popular opinion. But men like that will never ascend into the hill of the Lord. I scarcely conceive of Elijah lisping to Ahab or Paul prettily chipping his words on Mars Hill. The incredible picture of a prophetic voice is what's so desperately missing from some of our pulpits today. And if we want to see baptisms, if we want to see soul winning, if we want to see church plants, it will first begin with the pulpits of Southern Baptist churches who do not apologize for the word of God, but preach it faithfully, compassionately, and convictionally. That's the picture of the Corinthian church. The church that was so hurting became the church that was so helping. Vigilance and victory is followed by one other picture that then aspects itself into the rest of the story. Verse 14. Let all that you do be done with love. No caveats. No conditions. Referring back to 1 Corinthians 13, he once again puts the gospel nugget of love right in the midst of everything we do. There is no conditions. You want to know the great difference between every religion in the world and Christianity? It's found in 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Every other religion, every other religion, including my former faith of Islam, believes in a conditional love, a love based on performance, and a God that does not love unless you love him first. In the Quran, in Surah 2, it says it this way, Allah loves those who do righteous deeds. It then further states, Allah hates sinners. But the radical change in my life happened when I walked into a church, this little tiny Southern Baptist church of 80 in Columbus, Ohio, and I heard Romans chapter 5, that God manifests, dwells, demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The beautiful picture of the gospel, it's an unconditional love, not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us and gave himself to be a propitiation for our sin. Let all that you do be done with love. It's not a love that is worldly, but it's a love that is heavenly. It's an unconditional love. It means whatever's happening in a church, you don't give up because the love of God compels you to push yourself in a church, love on that church, watch the change in a church, and maybe, maybe just see Revival, renewal, refreshment happened in that church. A quarter century ago, I moved to the south, and I didn't want to to move to the south. I'm from Ohio. I don't know if there are any other Yankees in here. Ah, fellow Yankees, fellow carpetbaggers. I didn't. I I, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio is where I was born. I'm still an Ohio State Buckeye fan. We had a good weekend. No threat to anybody. We're the Buckeyes. You know what a Buckeye is? It's a useless nut. We're the Ohio State worthless nuts. That's what we defined ourselves as. (laughs) Just thank God we're not Tennessee. (laughs) And uh, I'd never wanted to move south. I didn't. But I moved because God called me first to Texas, North Carolina, now Georgia. And I'll tell you, there's an undercurrent that still streams from the Second Great Awakening that happens in much of the south. That didn't take me long to moved to the south. Two theological words drew me south. Daisy Duke. That now ages myself if you know the term. And I moved south. And I moved to North Carolina. The country of North Carolina. And man, they wouldn't take me hunting. They wouldn't put a gun in a former Muslim's hands. But they took me snipe hunting. That was interesting enough. Southerners are the most innovative people in all the world. You know that. It was a southerner who discovered milk. I am quite sure. Two older gentlemen sitting out in a pasture somewhere in Georgia one day. It's about 5 o'clock in the morning. They're staring at a cow. One man looks at another and says, I wonder what happens when you squeeze that. (laughs) We now have milk. In the middle of all that, I thought, Lord, you got me in the south. South. Didn't expect it to stay, and here I am a quarter century later. But you know what happened? Where my brother and I pastored together, we decided to move my grandmother down. My grandmother was 91 years old. Stockholm, Sweden is where she was born and raised. She moved over to the States when she was 66 years old. She sold everything she had so this immigrant family could have food on the table. And God said, move her to Wood, North Carolina, population 118. 
Unless someone got pregnant, we changed the sign to 119. Tiny little town. I thought, Lord, I don't, I don't know. She, she, she's Swedish. She doesn't speak English. They barely speak English out there. Are you sure? And God just said, trust me. And because of verse 14, that church literally loved this lost Swedish woman to Christ. So that a year later, I'm going to teach youth on a Wednesday night, she stops me. After a thousand times I'd witnessed to her and everything seemed like it hit the ceiling, she stops me and she says, I want to know the same Jesus you know. At the age of 92, she places her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let all that you do be done with love. There are no excuses not to be loving. In fact, he then brags on three people. Stephanus, we know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul baptizes Stephanus. Stephanus is there to pick up the letter. This is a man that Paul has deeply woven himself into. Fortunatus and Achaicus, we don't know anything about him. On their tombstone is simply 1 Corinthians 16, 17. That's it. But it, wouldn't that be enough? If all people knew about you is you love Jesus and you served him, wouldn't that be enough? enough but why does he brag on them as found at the end of verse 15 for they devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints fortunatus most likely helped plant this church and as he is pointing towards it you have to understand stephanus is not the first disciple he's not the first converse dionysius and others are before him but most likely, he brags on them because these three would not give up on this church. If Jesus Christ had died for them, they weren't leaving. They recognized something. They needed the church, and the church needed them. The secret of Christianity is that we are not merely dependent wholly on God. We are dependent upon each other. I need you. And as scary as it may sound, you need me. And we need each other. And we need to stop making excuses of why people don't go to church. Because I've heard them all, haven't you? I don't like them because they're hypocrites. Give me one place, just one in this world where there aren't hypocrites. I find them in my house when I'm there. I find them in my football teams when I sometimes root for them. I find them in my church. It's not an excuse that levies any persuasion. I don't like the church because there are crazy people there. Yep. There are crazy people in every church in the world. In your church, there are crazy people. You know them. You know if I stopped and said, hey, guys, just think of one crazy person. You got them? Here's a hint. If there's no one in your head, it's you. You're it. But you know what's fascinating about this passage? The Apostle Paul did not say, you need to be refreshed, did he? After bragging on those three, he ends the passage in verse 18. And what does he say at the beginning of verse 18? For they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge such men. The hidden secret of Christianity is that the deeper and longer you serve the Lord, the more you need him. Revival is not simply for those who are outside the church walls, who are backward and backslidden. Revival is for us. We who find ourselves on a Tuesday morning in chapel and you serve Jesus. You're studying. You're pastoring. You're sharing. You're doing all the things the Lord's called you to do. And if you're honest with the Lord and yourself this morning, you're just a bit worn out. And it's not just the studies and the projects and the papers from demonic professors. No, it, it's other things that's going on. It's personal and it's professional and it's familial and it's sociological. And you say, what can I do? And just remember this, if the Apostle Paul needed to be refreshed, who are you not to be? And then he says something at the end. Therefore... Therefore, acknowledge such men. Do you know why I became a church historian? That phrase. That phrase is a reminder to me to give honor to whom honor is due. To 
tell the stories of saints in the past that buoy our spirits for the present and allow us to see a great future. My heartbeat, what I teach at Truett McConnell University, what I have done for almost 20 years is Anabaptistic. Our forefathers, whether you want to see them spiritually, historically, are the Anabaptists of the Reformation. 500 years ago, these men and women stood firm for the gospel of Jesus Christ and paid the highest and ultimate price. And you can't get past, as some Truett alums who are in here know, you can't get past Truett McConnell and graduate without hearing about the Anabaptists. You have to take my class in Baptist history in order to graduate, and the first seven weeks are dedicated to them. One of my favorite people to acknowledge is a man who shouldn't have been there. His name is Felix Montz. Our music school is named after him. Felix Montz was born somewhere around 1500. We don't know because he was the illegitimate son of a Catholic priest. He shouldn't have been here. You see, he grew up in Zurich, Switzerland. He was born there in Zurich. The major church in town was known as the Grossmünster. Behind Grossmünster was Concubine Street not a hundred yards past the church. That's where priests went to sleep with women. Ultimately, from there comes the life of Felix Montz, and nobody wanted to acknowledge his existence. After all, he was an illegitimate kid, at least in the world's eyes. He walked the cobblestone streets. He grew up, and wouldn't you know it, the pastor changed. A new man came in who was more of a shepherd and less of an immoralist. And Felix walked in and heard a Bible study. As he walked in, he heard the gospel. Jesus saved him, and his life changed. He found purpose and meaning. He became an apologist, and he became an evangelist. He started to share Jesus. The rest of his life would go like this. Share Jesus, go to prison, be tortured, told not to share Jesus, be released, share Jesus, go to prison, be tortured, and on the list went. Ultimately, they realized young Felix was too obstinate in his faith to do anything else but share Jesus. So they decided to execute him. January the 5th, 1527, at 3 p.m., he's walked from that watery dungeon in Zurich, Switzerland, that's in the middle of the Limont River. And he's paraded around the city in order to mock him. The crowds gathered by the hundreds, laughing at him and scoffing at him. As he's walking past the very church where he was saved, he hears the bold voice of his mother. Now, if you were a mom of a 26-year-old that's about to pay the highest penalty for his faith, what would you be saying? What would you be praying? She didn't pray for his deliverance. She whispered into his ear, Felix, stand firm, Felix. Whatever you do, just stand firm. He walks right past her. We learn where he gets his boldness from. You see, his best friend, Conrad Grable, led his mother to Jesus, and she was never the same either. He walks across the bridge where underneath it's the Limont River where they will drown him. And once again, his mother calls out, and Anna says, Felix, stand firm, Felix. Whatever you do, Felix, just stand firm. He crosses the bridge. Historians will say he turns to the right, put him in a little boat, take him to the middle of that shallow river and dump his body into the water. The last words he hears are those of his own mother who once again just call out, Felix, stand firm, Felix. Whatever you do, just stand firm. He's drowned, put into a common cemetery. We don't know where he is today. He was meant to be forgotten. Yet, some 500 years later, here you and I are in a seminary chapel in the deep south, and we acknowledge such men. What is it going to take? What is it going to take for Southern Baptists to turn around and see the days of salvation, church planting, evangelism, discipleship? It's going to take two things. It's going to take a Felix Montz who is willing to realize your past does not have to be your present. And your God can be your guide. And secondly, it's going to take an Anna Mons, those older in generation, those ahead, who simply call out, stand firm. We got your back, we got your front, we got your side. And we believe in a 
as long as the resurrection is true. The great future we will have will be based if we stand firm on the word of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, may that be the case. There are a lot of churches that are hurting. There are a lot of Christians who are hurting, but the word refresh, the same word you meant in salvation is still there for us and applicable today. Would our hearts and our souls be refreshed and may it not be for ourselves. May it be for your glory. May it be for the salvation of nations. May it be to see what is a renewal of churches around America Baptist, evangelical, born again, blood bought believers who will simply stand on Jesus regardless of the consequences. We pray in Jesus' name.